Good morning. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the next uh, plenary session. Uh, I'm Paul Parker Johnson from uh, ACG Research. Um, and uh, just from a, um, a session housekeeping point of view, uh, I think you might make the astute observation that I am not, in fact, Malik Tatipamula. Um, uh, and uh, those of you who may have uh, looked in your programs and uh, noticed Malik as uh, uh, the host for this session, uh, Malik had some unexpected uh, travel demands occur uh, over the weekend and asked me if I would be uh, willing to step in uh, and host the session for him, which I am happy to do. Um, I, I thought of, you know, maybe making a life-size replica of Malik and standing it here next to me and seeing if we could, you know, maybe ventriloquist uh, uh, support his talk as we went forward. But no, I thought better of it and I thought maybe we'd better stick to the agenda as it was uh, and move on with it. <laughs> um, in this session, uh, we're taking up the use of open source uh, SDN and service provider use cases in a, a variety of different contexts. Um, in our practice, we um, have a chance to look at the uptake for SDN and virtual system infrastructures in many different service provider use cases, and it is indeed um, a topic that needs uh, deep inspection and good, thoughtful, uh, good, thoughtful comments. And uh, to address the subjects, we've uh, brought together four uh, very influential and very well-respected uh, contributors to the SDN uh, and virtual system infrastructures environment uh, in service provider uh, deployments today. Um, and I'll, I'll bring them out each here one at a time. Uh, and we'll get on with uh, each of their presentations for, for the session. Um, the first person that we're um, uh, having on the agenda is uh, Tom Anschutz from AT&T. Tom, maybe you could join us. Here he comes. <laughs> Tom is a distinguished member of the technical staff at AT&T and is uh, instrumental in the development of uh, AT&T's SDN and NFV architecture uh, called Domain 2.0, as you know. Um, he's the editor and chief contributor to AT&T's white paper that uh, describes the vision of what will become a, a transformative initiative to um, transform public networking and cloud computing. Um, and he's working on some very interesting projects that uh, I know you're going to hear about today, including the CORD uh, initiative and the um, uh, optical transport broadband access initiative that John uh, mentioned earlier. Tom, welcome. Um, uh, next person who uh, is joining us for the panel is Kelly Harrell from Brocade Communications. Kelly, maybe you could join us. <laughs> Kelly has a, a, a long history in open source initiatives and uh, I think is one of the more imaginative um, uh, general managers in the market today uh, around um, creating valuable open source offerings and uh, integrating them into uh, open architecture deployments. Uh, he's the VP and general manager of the software business unit at Brocade um, and leads the software networking strategy and execution at the company. Uh, responsible for driving growth through the delivery of an innovative virtual networking platform, um, which I've had a chance to see multiple times, <laughs> uh, and uh, advancing the company's technology portfolio and customer base in uh, cloud and service provider markets. Um, some very interesting perspectives on um, nurturing open source developments from within a company that also has its own uh, intellectual property uh, offerings in the market at the same time uh, will come up in Kelly's talk. Next person who uh, is with us is uh, Ayush Sharma from Huawei. And Ayush, maybe you could join us, please. Thank you. As, C as CTO and Senior Vice President of uh, the, the Networks Business Division of Huawei, Ayush leads a global team of technologists. It's as you can imagine, it's a rather large team, and it's involved in a number of different initiatives um, that we've had a chance to chat about. Um, and he's responsible for driving future architecture, research, innovation, standardization, and open source strategy 
leading to the introduction of technologies and architectural concepts into products and services. And the, the scope is, is rather large from a, a service provider use cases point of view, and the contributions to both open source and uh, solution offerings are substantial. Um, so I, I know you'll enjoy Ayush's comments here on the panel. And then the last person who's joining us is Jen Rexford from Princeton University's Computer Science Department. Jen, maybe you could join us. Many of you know Jen from a variety of different initiatives, um, either prior open networking summits or research papers you've read or sessions that you've been involved with. Um, she's joining us in this session this morning to share uh, some work that she's been doing related to creating uh, use of SDN in internet exchange provider um, settings, uh, creating a so-called software-defined exchange. Um, and so we'll pursue uh, these presentations in the order that um, the folks have joined us on the stage. Um, uh, and uh, we'll hold the question and answer for the end when all four presentations have been done. We, we have uh, just a few minutes before it's important to break um, for lunch. Uh, and we have time for some questions uh, that you might have for any of the speakers. Um, so why don't we begin with this gentleman here. Oh, thanks. This is primarily for Brocade and Huawei. How does a, one of your customers decide which vendor to pick, considering open, commercial open source vendor to pick, considering there's so many different variations, combinations, and permutations? Uh, for example, I've already defined five different models, reference models for SDN. All of them have their own specific attributes. What, what kind of criteria uh, does one use? Because it seems to be extremely confusing. Do you want to start? Wanna, yeah, go ahead, please. Um, well, I, the good news is that you have a lot of reference models. <laughs> <laughs> the reason you have a lot of reference models is because there's a lot to choose from. And this is kind of the, the nature of the beginnings of innovation, right? So you, you've got the chance to figure out uh, what is possible. Now the question is from a, a business strategy, what needs to be prioritized? That's typically the way that, 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 that I've seen uh, the decision models uh, go forward is it starts off with uh, um, technically what's possible, then presented to, uh, to the, the business side of the house and say, which ones are, are, are most urgent? Which ones do we need to go for? So that begins to narrow the field a little bit. And once you begin to narrow the field, you'll find maybe certain, certain projects or are more applicable to certain workloads than other projects. And so that can, that can usually uh, narrow it down just based upon the fact that there are business issues, some of which are more pressing than others, and you also have resource limitations as to how much you can apply to any given uh, set of projects at a given time. So based on our experiences, uh, we've, uh, we've seen that you know, it depends on customer to customer. Uh, but the two sort of prime categories I would like to put the use cases on, and this is use cases driven, one is more on the TCO reduction. So I've seen some of our carrier customers are more concerned about putting uh, putting SDN into the transport domain. And the reasons are obviously they want to reduce their total cost of ownership over there. On the contrary, there are uh, carrier customers who have a compelling reason to make money and they are rolling out some greenfield services which they will later on integrate with, the, with, the, with their brownfield network. So let's say if some carriers are building a new central office and then uh, they will integrate that with the, with the old one. So there they can afford to sort of play with the technology a little bit uh, more than the, what they will usually do. So now uh, coming specifically to the open source one, uh, now, it, it, you give the total, they are bothered about total SLA, they are bothered about total maturity of the solutions, not about the one piece of that stack. Of course, at, if you go to their architecture uh, team or research team, they will say, yeah, this controller versus that controller, there are these architecture benefits. But when you go to the operations and production team in our experience, that is what they're looking for is the complete maturity of the stack. So if us as a vendor are able to provide that SLAs, us as a vendor provide to do that compelling prepositions, then they will choose that. If it's not, they will just go to the other vendor. So that's, that's based on our experience. 
I encourage any of you who uh, also have questions, come on up. I have a couple um, that uh, we, we can touch on um, in the last uh, couple minutes here. Jen, I had a question about your work on the, the SDX and uh, was wondering for the, for the organizations who have been contributing or are interested in it so far, mm -hmm. are they coming at it more from an experimental point of view or are they you know, kind of more uh, urgently wishing that this could be made, uh, you know, broadly available and hardened um, because they would really like to use it tomorrow. Uh, it's a little bit of both. I mean, some of the use cases for the research and education networks relate to large scientific data transfers, like Large Hadron Collider data, for example, that takes up a lot of bandwidth on interconnect between between continents. So in that case, it's about re maybe doing those data transfers much more quickly and much more efficiently. Uh, and the, the DDoS medication example is, I think, a fairly urgent one for a lot of people, and the ability to scale up their NFE deployments as well, to be able to potentially move some of the NFE work further upstream and run that at the exchange as well, so that unwanted traffic can be blocked before it actually hits their organizations. I think that that particular application is not super sophisticated, but it's actually really, really useful. Right, understood. Thank you. Looks like we have a gentleman here. Uh, actually, it's also for Jan. Uh, actually, there is an extension to BGP called Flow Spec. I, I was wondering if you could compare, contrast a little bit, because it can be used to drop the packet, redirect the packet, sample the packet, change the quality of service, and people have used it to do service chaining, all sorts of stuff. Can you a little bit? Uh... Yeah, that's a really good point. So BGP flow spec essentially allows the next top reachability information in BGP to match on, on other fields. And the, the difficulty there is in part the level of support for it in the data plane of legacy routers. So if you have a, all the routers to have support it, you're in, in business. <laughs> But if the router doesn't, there's an advantage to having a single switch at a central location that does and putting the functionality there. But you're totally right. If the routers already have flow spec, a number of the examples I mentioned are, are feasible with flow spec. Yeah. With the central switch, the part that I didn't really get is ultimately the route server tells the router either the, here is the block or he says, I don't, you don't have the block. So in which case, you know, both routers and the two cities and they connect to the same exchange point, if they get the prefix, regardless of the application, that router will carry it all the way to the switch, and then you cannot really move to the other switch at that point. I mean, it's kind of, I, I didn't really get how you, uh, you know, make sure that the video traffic came from one city, but uh, the other one, you know. So for the application-specific peering example, there would be, let's say, one default route in BGP that you're using, and then you might have a special policy in, in mind for your video traffic. And so that the, the rule at the switch would end up bifurcating the, the traffic, but the BGP route would refer either to one of the routes or using AS set to refer to both of them. So in some sense, that would give the upstream provider the information he would need to know about the set of AS as his traffic might traverse. I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're asking. Yeah, but I'll follow up. Yeah, I'll follow up. Thank right. you. Okay. Hi, Jen. So, <laughs> we've been exchanging metadata in band in from communities for many, many years. I mean, all the use cases you've described been supported again by using communities for many years. Mm -hmm. So, well, it absolutely makes sense to decouple BGP control plane from forwarding using OpenFlow, P4, or whatever you use. The question really, are you going to define new northbound set of protocols to define those policies? Because, again, forwarding is there, it's done, it's valuable. How you are going to define these new policies, not just mention community and do something or flow spec, but really business-driven logic into SDX? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So our initial work is focused on using uh, our frenetic language for specifying higher level policies, which is sort of naturally compositional. Uh, but there's, a, there's an interesting question here of whether we could go higher level than that. Because these applications are pretty different from one another. I mean, just DDoS mitigation is quite different than inbound traffic engineering. So it may very well be that there's a different northbound API for these applications if you really want to just be able to signal, this is the traffic I want to block, or this is the traffic I want to be able to split over one inbound interface over another. So depending on how high level you mean the interface to be, if the carrier is going to write an application and run on the SDX, we can offer one language abstraction. But if they don't want to write code and would rather just signal in a way that communities have supported in a more primitive way before, then we might have a more you know, per application API for those. All right, I had uh, uh, maybe a wrap-up question, in this case for Tom, um, r related to the CORD effort. Um, and it's grounded in the dynamics of um, multiple open components coming together in a deployment model. So you have, uh, in some cases, uh, open hardware um, or, or disaggregated hardware and open software in different 
categories. So I'm thinking of it from the operator's point of view. For you to get to the point where you um, have a model that you think is deployable, um, because if, if AT&T central offices, 4,000 of them, <laughs> or however many, are, are to be re-architected, um, then are you taking on the integrator's role yourself, or are you thinking that um, it's, a, uh, it's a collaboration among uh, implementers that comes together each time you do it? Or how, how are you attacking the, you know, let's integrate this so that it behaves in a manner that we um, are looking for um, as we go to replicate it? That's a great question, thanks. Um, <laughs> and so, um, we do think that in, in many ways, uh, the role of the carrier changes uh, as we move forward. That um, um, if you go back and think about some of the you know, water cooler conversations we've had in the past, or in the recent past, they've been things like, well, a lot of the competencies that carriers had once upon a time have kind of leaked out and have become sort of the, the realm and the, um, and the business of the suppliers. And in many cases, we're operating technologies we don't fundamentally understand in every case. So um, one of the things that comes along with this, uh, you know, all the wonderful flexibility and capabilities and engagement in open source is you really have to take ownership of your business. You have to mind your own business at the end of the day, right? And that means you do need to be able to not have a someone else's throat to choke. It's really, if it's your problem, it's your problem and own up to it. Those are, those are interesting things to learn and, and operationalize, but they're also tremendously enabling, right? That gives you a great amount of confidence as a carrier at the end of the day with the solutions you do roll out. Sounds like you're largely stepping up as an organization yourselves. Yeah. Well, congratulations. Well, thanks. It's <laughs> a good one. All right, I'd like to thank uh, each one of you for, for participating in the panel. It was really outstanding. Uh, great perspectives. Thank you very much. Um, and I, I encourage you to uh, take in the, the demonstrations and the follow-on sessions that go into deeper dives on these uh, topics or show you the real thing in action as you go into the afternoon. Thank you very much. Have a great uh, afternoon. <laughs>